Hello everyone. Welcome to the following session on GRASP. Myself Sudeep Samanjay, founder of GRASP and alumnus of Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Today we have a distinguished expert on our platform, P.S. Raghavan. P.S. Raghavan was chairman of National Security Advisory Board of India from 2016 to 2020 and ambassador to Russia from 2014 to 2016. He has pursued his diplomatic assignments in Russia, United Kingdom, Poland, South Africa and Vietnam and served as ambassador to Czech Republic, Ireland and Russia. He was joint secretary in the Prime Minister's office from 2000 to 2004, where he dealt with various important sections for countries' development, such as external affairs, nuclear energy, space, defense and national security. He founded and headed the Development Partnership Administration, which coordinates India's economic partnership with developing countries. So we are extremely elated to have him join us on our platform where he will share his profound insights towards external relations of the country and its national security. It's an honor to have you here, sir, with us. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. My great Thank pleasure. You. Sir, uh, so starting with our very first uh, question. So what is your take on current Indian external relations? Can you address about the areas where we have strongly progressed and the areas where we are lagging or dependent? Uh, you know, it's a very wide subject, India's external relations. Uh, I think what we need to first uh, pinpoint is that what is the purpose of our external relations? What do our external relations seek to do? Uh, the first and foremost, the duty of any government is obviously to promote the development and the national goals of the country. So what are our national goals? Our national goals are to uh, rapidly grow the country, economic development with equity, uh, in such a way that India becomes a developed country in the shortest possible period of time. Now, uh, uh, it follows from there that you become a developed country, you will also become a, a major power in the world because your influence in the world depends on how strong you are domestically. So, if you now look at what our external relations are and what our external relations are aiming to do, our external relations are aiming to promote for our country the goal that we want in our country. So, what do we need? We need to uh, be able to build up a network of relations that promotes our economic engagement with the world in such a way as to uh, enable uh, our co companies from developing markets abroad, being able to access investment, being able to access resources, to being able to, uh, including critical resources, being able to guarantee the uh, supply to our country. Politically, you also want to ensure that you do not get pressure on your country for taking decisions which you don't want to take. I, I think the most, most uh, graphic illustration is what you see about what's going on between Russia and Ukraine. What do you need in your external relations? You need to be able to, uh, to exercise and to preserve your strategic autonomy of action for you to be able to act in your interest and in your national interest as promotes your national goals. So if you look at it, this is the objective of external relations and this is what we are constantly trying to do. And obviously, the, your uh, influence in the external world will depend on your comprehensive national strength, how well you are able to uh, uh, maintain security in your country, how harmonious your inter- uh, state inter-regional uh, relations are within your country, how well the progress in various economic initiatives take place, how does growth, uh, how can you ensure growth while ensuring also equitable development. So it, it's one package actually, external relations, internal uh, uh, governance are all one package and what India, and you can see what India has achieved over the period over the last, of course, 70 uh, odd years since our independence, 
but also in the last, particularly over the last decade, you can see how fast India has progressed, how, how much recognition India has acquired in the world around, how our economic relationship has developed, how our political influence has developed, and, and, and of course, side by side, our challenges have increased as well. The kind of interconnected world that you have, the kind of threats that you get from abroad, you're constantly countering these challenges, uh, the external threats to your own autonomy, to your own independence, to your own security. So it's it's a package. But India, I think, has done extraordinarily well in its external relations over the last uh, uh, decade in particular, uh, but, but certainly since its independence. So we are happy to know that, sir. And what are some notable countries that India recognize as its friend? And who are our enemies and who are our frenemies? Yeah, you know, these are these are good catchwords to have, but not necessarily uh, relevant in that sense in external relations. Firstly, you know, friends and enemies or even frenemies are things that you look at in your personal relationships. Uh, interpersonal relationships. The, the relationships with countries are far more complex. And particularly, you know, after the end of the Cold War, during the Cold War, you had also this group, you had these two blocks, political military blocks, you had the NATO led by the US, you had the Warsaw Pact led by the Soviet Union. So they, they, there were these groups of people, and then you had this non-aligned block, which was separate. So at uh, which was trying to maintain its independence from both these blocks. Now, at that time, you could talk in more uh, specific terms about alignment and non-alignment. Today, in the post-Cold War world, when the uh, networks of international relationships has opened up hugely, globalization has ensured that the movement of technologies, people, uh, information flows freely across countries. So in this situation, you know, your interests, your national interests, which I talked about earlier, what you want to promote in your country and what, what are the national interests which you're trying to further, these national interests will require you to uh, share some interests with some countries and not, uh, some of your interests may not coincide with those countries. Therefore, to, to define Friends or enemies or frenemies is very difficult in today's post-Cold War world. And you can see this around us. Uh, you know, you take, for example, again, to take the latest Russia-Ukraine example, uh, we had uh, great differences with uh, countries in the, uh, with, with the United States and other countries in the West because they saw the whole conflict in, in, in different terms from the way we saw it also. Our interests, because of this, our location, our geography, our geopolitical outlook from looking at the world from India, as well as our defense cooperation with Russia, all of this ensured that we, we reacted in, on this crisis in a different way. So uh, you can see that, you know, uh, the United States is our most important bilateral uh, relationship. So you can call it, of course, a friend, but at the same time, there are, uh, all our interests are not entirely identical. Similarly, Russia. We've had a history of very close relations with Russia. But once again, there are various areas in which our, our interests are not the same and where our outlook is not the same. So you, you look at the world today not in terms as, as friends and enemies and frenemies. Again, if you look at China. Uh, China is our, our biggest strategic challenge today. As you know, there is still a standoff at the line of actual control between India and China. At the same time, China is one of our most important economic partners. India-China uh, trade uh, is, is among the highest of our bilateral trade. And similarly, there is Chinese investment, there are Chinese products here. So can you call China a, a friend? Can you call it an enemy? Can you call it a frenemy? I think essentially we have a number of interests which are common, number of interests which are not common, number of areas where we are actually in uh, confrontation with each other. The, the, the uh, challenge to external affairs policy, foreign policy, is to be able to handle all of these without saying that, you know, you are my enemy, I will not talk to you. Uh, or 
that you are our friend and therefore I will support you in everything that you do. Neither is possible in today's world. So it's a far more complex exercise. You have at the same time confrontation and cooperation going on uh, or cooperation and not entire identity of interest. So it's a, it's a far more complex thing. So if you if you want me to identify, yes, the United States is a very important partner of ours. It's probably the most important partner in today's world because it is the most powerful country in the world. Uh, we have great interest in trade, we, uh, technology, investments. It is an increasingly important defense partner. So in a number and politically, of course, as democracies also as our uh, Indian uh, diaspora in uh, America gains in number and influence. We have many Indian students studying in America. So you have a whole range of commonalities with America, plus the fact that there is one commonality we share here in the Indo-Pacific. America considers China to be a major rival to its superpower status. We have strategic challenges with China. So our cooperating with America to try to 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 draw China into a cooperative order in the Indo-Pacific to prevent Chinese hegemony in the Pacific. This is a very major interest. So you see the whole range of interests we have. Similarly with Russia, you know, we have a continental besides the maritime and the Indo-Pacific zone. We have a continental area where we, we uh, it is the, that area, Central Asia, uh, Iran, Afghanistan and even West Asia sandwiched between Russia, China and India. We need to make sure that we are uh, uh, engaging with Russia to protect our security economic interests in that area. And Russia is our biggest defense partner in spite of the expansion of our defense partnership. So Russia is again a partner of great importance. At the same time, Russia-China relations worry us. The way in which Russia is getting close to China, some of Russia's actions in Afghanistan and Pakistan has worried us. We don't agree with them. Russia doesn't agree with our engagement with uh, America in the Indo-Pacific. So we have a complex relationship, and yet it is an old relationship of importance. China, I already mentioned China, our strongest trade partner, biggest investment partner, great trade dispute, great border dispute, China's activity in the neighborhood we do not like. So uh, these are the complex things, yet we are dealing with China. We have to deal with China. It's a very powerful country. Five times our uh, GDP, 10 times our foreign exchange reserves, et etc. Et so it's very complex and calculative compared to what we just look at it from outside and it's really great insight to obtain this from you sir sir and what are some of the sectors in which we are heavily dependent on other countries and what are some sectors where the world is dependent on us see one of the things that covid taught us and the, our experience during covid is that globalization and the spread of technology has ensured a global interdependence. Everybody is dependent on everybody else. And by the way, this Russia-Ukraine war is also showing uh, showing us a similar, uh, uh, giving us a, sim a similar lesson. Uh, now, you know, India has great advantages. India has the advantage of population, India has demography. India has the advantage of economic uh, a market that it offers to countries. It has technical uh, skill, technical manpower. So there are a variety of areas in which the world looks to India and wants to develop relations with India. And similarly, there are various areas in which uh, on which we are dependent on on on, on the world. Uh, if you start with what first with what we are dependent on. Uh, you know, we uh, still require technologies both for our economic development and for our military development. So the, the, uh, the, the search for technology, the search for transfer of technologies, transfer of technologies in such a manner that we become self-dependent over a period of time, self-reliant over a period of time. This is a major uh, requirement of us. We want technologies, we want trade, we want because you know, 40% of our GDP is trade. It's very important that we, we uh, develop our trade relations, which means also being able to uh, expand our exports to other countries. So we are then natural resources. There are a variety of natural resources on for which we depend on the world. And these are not just for military requirement, even for day-to-day -day, uh, uh, economic development. And then, of course, we discovered how 
the flow of chips can be a major problem. And this is not just an Indian problem, it's a world problem, uh, the, the uh, shortage of chips. So the manner in which we need to develop our semiconductor industry, as you see, we are doing that now. It's a recognition of our dependence, which we do not, which we want to reduce. So we have dependencies of that kind. At the same time, as I said, we have this, we have our strength. When countries want to do, we, where the prime minister has said recently, we are the pharmacy of the world. So, uh, you know, we are actually manufacturing vaccines, we are manufacturing uh, pharmaceuticals. But at the same time, there also there is a dependence. The raw materials for these pharmaceuticals come very largely from China. So over a period of time, we have to reduce that dependence on one country, increase the dependence on ourselves, increase our own pharmaceutical API manufacturers, API as they call them, and diversify it. So it is both ways. We have also a number of foreign companies have set up a shop in India in order to promote their research because you have a skilled manpower, you have manpower available at good uh, 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 cost to the companies compared to costs in Western countries. So we are actually an R&D hub in many ways for the rest of the world. In fact, even if you look at semiconductors uh, and chips, you see so much of, and you know this very well, so much of design of chips is actually done in India by Indians or in fact by NRIs around the world. The, the, the design is done. So what we can do is try to uh, maximize these contributions within our country in order to promote our self-reliance. So it's a, again, dependent, interdependence is a very complex thing. We are dependent on countries. Countries can, are not, even if not dependent, can actually we offer benefits to countries uh, in various sectors. And these are just some of the sectors that I mentioned. You can actually go uh, sector by sector and get a whole range of areas in which we can contribute to the world and a whole range of areas in which we are dependent where we should reduce our dependence. Of course, uh, the, the defense area is a very major area where we have an external dependence, which we are trying very, very hard to, uh, to, to cut down, to reduce. Firstly, to diversify acquisitions in order not to have all eggs in one basket. And secondly, to try to increase our own capacities and capabilities. Thanks a lot uh, for your answer, sir. Uh, this was a very insightful one. And again, coming to our uh, question, who are our most important defense partners and who are our best economic partners so far till date? See, as far as defense partners goes, uh, we inherited by the end of the Cold War a very major dependence on Russia. The uh, Russian uh, and, and of course from the Soviet times. But what we have done over a period of time is try to reduce this monopoly hold that Russia had on our defense uh, supplies. Uh, we have diversified very strongly, particularly in the from about 2005 onwards, after the United, we, our strategic partnership with the United States and with the European countries uh, uh, and with Israel also increased greatly. Our defense suppliers are now much more diversified. Now, if you look at what the latest uh, arms transfer registered, the CIPRI, Stockholm International Peace and Research Institute, they put out every year an arms transfer uh, data. The la over the last five years, 49% of our defense equipment came from Russia. Uh, so it is still 49. It was 60, so, sorry, 46%, not 49, 46%. It was 69% in the previous five year uh, period. So we are gradually uh, reducing dependence, but still it is our strongest defense partner. I think about 27% came from France, which is a big percentage if you see that it started from nearly zero in the early 2000s. Uh, about 12% or something is from the United States. Again, it's from zero. From about zero in 2005, it's come to about 20 odd billion dollars now. So it gradually, and Israel is a very important partner as well. It's not in the first three. It was in the first three about two or three years ago. So, but these are, they, they just sort of change positions, US, Israel. Uh, but you see gradually that these are our uh, partners which are increasing their proportion in the Indian defense market. Uh, at the same time, Russia remains a very important, extremely important supplier in the defense market. And the other importance of Russia is that 
it is willing to transfer more technologies to India than these other countries are. Gradually, that is also changing. But this transfer of technology is important because it is also helping us set up our own strong defense industry, which we need very much because if you want to be a powerful country, you need to have a strong defense industry. So that is the other aspect. Now you can use this to, uh, to sort of nudge other countries to do similarly. So these are our uh, the defense partnerships that we have. Economic, well, uh, the main partners are uh, the US and China. The US is, as I said, uh, we depend on the US for trade technology investments much more than China, but in terms of just trade, our trade with China has increased uh, to roughly the same level as that of the US. So these are the two main trade partners. The European Union is a very important, as a whole, is a very important partner for, again, trade and uh, uh, technology and investment. Uh, in the European Union, of course, uh, the, the France and Germany and UK are, are the strongest partners. But it doesn't mean that we don't have partnerships with the others in specific niche areas. So, sir, what relations do you think are necessary for the future of India to strengthen ourselves strong? Uh, I think all relations are important. Actually, we should not try to prioritize uh, relations in that sense. Of course, some are important. As I said, the United States is, is the most important. So if you if you take these great powers, all the great powers, the US, European Union, uh, Russia, and China in different ways. They are all important partners for our engagement. But let us not actually uh, try to diminish the value of even small countries, uh, which can both teach us things as well as be helpful for us in economic and even political terms. I mean, if you look at it in political terms, the United Nations has 193 members and every one of them has one vote whether it's the United States of America or the Solomon Islands. That's true. And, and if you look at it, you know, I, I always give this example of Ireland, which is a small country where I served as well. Uh, it's a country with just four odd million people uh, and therefore tiny compared to India. But uh, if you look at, for example, you know, this whole outsourcing uh, industry that India built, uh, the call centers that uh, grew in India, they were the pioneers of that. Also, skilling, this uh, right skilling people is at various levels, not just the university education and the uh, uh, research in universities, but polytechnics, uh, right skilling at various levels, being able to uh, match the requirements of the economy with the skilling of the people for that economy. Ireland has done enormous work, and there's a lot that we can learn from Ireland. We refuse to learn from them because we say, ah, they're a small country, we are a big country, wo kya hume kya that's not the way to look at it. You know, there are various countries can teach us various things, and we need to have the humility to accept that and, and the uh, sense to look out for what we can get from various countries, however small they may be. Many of the smaller African countries, not smaller, but many of the poorer African countries are uh, have resources which are very important for our economy. And this is something that we need to be, uh, we need to develop relations with them in order to, to access those resources. So, and similarly, if you look at the small Pacific Islands, the, the whole chain of Pacific Islands, and look at the way today, actually, I don't know if you're following this, China signed some kind of an agreement, security agreement with the Solomon Islands. It's a tiny island in the Pacific, tiny set of islands in the Pacific. Now the United States has sent a delegation to the Solomon Islands because they want to make sure that uh, China does not have uh, a foothold there. So, these, because Pacific Islands are important for strategic reasons, for reasons of who controls that area of the Pacific. So, various countries have importance in various areas which we need to understand and which we need to develop relations to, to uh, use that. So that's really great and interesting to know. Usually, whenever we see media, newspapers and all, we do get carried away with uh, certain really big names and certain very specific areas. But it's really great that 
the prioritization of all other sectors you are providing equal weightage to it and it's also a new knowledge for all our users as well so as to recognize the importance of each and every sector sir and coming to the current world happening uh, the especially the ukraine uh, crisis the russian ukraine crisis so how has the russian conflict in ukraine affected india and uh, we are also see that there has been lot of noise from the west about india abstaining its involvement so do you justify india's stance in abstaining from ukraine russian conflict yeah you know the russia ukraine conflict is a very complex uh, one uh, in its particularly in its origins and really speaking if you look at it it is not a russia ukraine conflict it is a russia nato russia us conflict which is playing itself out in ukraine um, and it goes back many many years uh, uh, from to the break up of the soviet union and the way in which uh, the western alliance uh, expanded whereas the warsaw pact collapsed and uh, dissolved the uh, nato expanded and reached all the way up to uh, russian borders and the failure of the west to have confidence building measures uh, with russia in order to allay its fears of nato surrounding russia nato uh, encircling russia and threatening it because when nato started building up its forces all around russia russia said why are you doing that we are not a threat to you Uh, and and so you know it is a grievance that russia has had over decades and then it came to the matter of ukraine ukraine is right next to russia ukraine is uh, the has very porous borders with russia if you want to compare uh, in some way you look at uh, india uh, india and nepal can you imagine if a foreign if a hostile power is located in nepal what a threat to indian security it will be because nepal is for the borders with india so they, they russia has various security perceptions various uh, security threats that it perceives in in nato's expansion nato and russia have not had a proper dialogue in order to be able to uh, to to uh, pacify these tensions so this is the background to this now the the foreground is a far more complicated thing there were discussions between russia and the us you know president biden and president putin had a uh, dialogue from june 2021 onwards they the 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 west accepted that russia had some security concerns uh, the the, the uh, dialogue did not progress in a proper way and at some point of time uh, the, the russia perceived this uh, uh, the threat of western powers uh, egging on ukraine to uh, take over the eastern ukrainian area which had become so, sort of uh, semi independent and which was the subject of this dialogue uh, between russia and nato russia got probably uh, feared that that was going to be uh, uh, stormed by ukraine and then it took this action now the point is i am not justifying russian action russia it is a violation of uh, territorial integrity it's a violation of national sovereignty there's no doubt about that at the same time we understand that big powers are often doing this when their national interests are threatened the, the americans invaded iraq in 2003 because they said that there were weapons of mass destruction which were never found uh, similarly china has been colonizing the all the parts of the south china sea that it claims as its own in spite of the fact that all many of the other countries in southeast asia are claiming those islands as well so big countries do when their national interests they feel are threatened and when they want to promote the national interest they do violate international law so we understand that we don't need to justify it but we can understand that that is one aspect of it the other aspect as i said that you know they it is a failure within europe to sort of set right a security architecture uh, in a harmonious fashion and this is this is boiled over uh, in that and the third aspect of it is that what i said you were talking there was a dialogue if eventually it went into war it's a failure of diplomacy on both sides so that's what our prime minister said when he had his meetings in the quad summit that look you get back to dialogue and diplomacy there was a dialogue and diplomacy you get back to that so this is broadly the the stand that we have taken of course in the background which i said already before are the importance of our relations with russia 
we 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 have an engagement with Russia on defense. We have a strong engagement with Russia in that entire uh, continental space, which I talk about, where, where you know, in the, in the Central Asian, uh, West Asian space, where, where we are along with Russia and China. So we have interests, our national interests in this part of the world, which we have to look after, rather than try to pander to what those people want us to say in the European theater. Now, that is the European theater of operation. And now you see the countries have understood this. When we had this two plus two dialogue, our defense and foreign ministers went and had this dialogue with their counterparts in the US. There was no criticism. There was this, I mean, they said that, you know, we would like you to join us, etc., etc. But and then uh, Prime Minister Johnson, Boris Johnson was here in uh, Delhi just a couple of days ago. He very clearly said that I understand that India has its own stand on this subject. So, uh, you know, there is a problem there. The, our our, our uh, idea is that the European security architecture is broken. It was never properly structured after the Cold War. It should have been done. This war is a is is, is a uh, unfortunate way of trying to do it. But please, all of you, get together and sort it out. But don't drag us into your dispute because we have bigger things to uh, bother about in our own uh, neighborhood. This is what we we uh, uh, we are saying, and this is the way we are reacting to it. And we see the understanding of the world. In this. And as I said sometime back in the, at the beginning of this interview, the whole objective of our foreign policy is to build a network of relationship that ensures us to read, that ensures our autonomy of action to protect our interests. And this is what is being shown here in our reaction to Ukraine. That, sir, uh, coming to our next question, are the sanctions affecting Russia as a whole? Because the whole West uh, took uh, a step to put some really hard sanctions on Russia on the economic sphere. And uh, what are NATO's direct and indirect expectations and who played the wisest game here? See, sanctions are a very complex subject. To start with, uh, sanctions in the way in which they have been imposed are not in accordance with international law. International, according to international law, sanctions are permitted, but when they are mandated by the United Nations, when the collective international community sees that there is a threat to its interests and therefore imposes sanctions. Such sanctions have been imposed in the past on Iran, they've been imposed on South North Korea, they've been imposed even on South Africa in a sense in the past. However, what is happening today is in the way uh, the world uh, politics has developed, Sanctions have become a very commonplace diplomatic tool for uh, countries, for the powerful countries against the weaker countries. Because it is the powerful countries which can impose sanctions. So we must remember that, that this is actually the tool of the powerful over the weaker. Uh, now, what have they, they again, these sanctions that they've imposed on Russia are not new. They started imposing sanctions on Russia after 2014, when uh, there was this annexation of Crimea. Uh, which became part of Russia uh, through a referendum that obviously Russia helped uh, and, and, and organized. Uh, since then, there have been sanctions against Russia. Those sanctions, you know, uh, were uh, the US and its European allies imposed sanctions on Russia. They, it consisted of, you know, visa bans, uh, asset freezes of Russians. It also, they were uh, uh, certain products they did not import from Russia, certain products they did not export to Russia, technology denials was there. What has happened now after this uh, Ukraine uh, war is a far more ferocious and harsh imposition of sanctions because they covered a much wider field. They also covered the financial uh, uh, sector. The banks, many of the Russian banks were cut off from relations with Western banks. US, Europe, and also, of course, Australia, Japan, and South Korea joined in as well. Uh, many of the Russian banks were cut off from the so-called SWIFT messaging system by which they correspond with banks around the world. And that actually cuts them off from all banks, not just US and European banks, but all banks around the world. Makes it difficult for them to do business. So all of this has been much harsher. And of course, even more, Russia's foreign exchange reserves, which are held in uh, in Western countries, in Western currencies, they were frozen. So this was very major. 
at the same time very harsh and uh, we say that russia invaded ukraine it was a violation of international law where we must like, accept that all this is also a violation of international law in different ways but not only that this violation also impacts now on other countries not just the countries that are imposing the sanctions which is the us europe australia japan south korea etc but also on others because you are not able to now deal with russia through these banks now as long as these are primary sanctions primary sanctions are those sanctions that actually uh, are imposed on countries for their companies for their territories for their nationals and for their currencies it is something when these sanctions begin to be applied in a secondary sense that is not only that i will not do business with russia but i'll also stop you from doing business with russia then it becomes secondary sanction then it becomes even more uh, violative of the freedom of others as well now so far that has not happened in this case so what what has what is india stand india stand is that look we are not again as i said we are not parties to your conflict so we will not abide by sanctions that you are unilaterally uh, imposing on russia and therefore we will do business with russia of course we have difficulty in doing business with russia and dollars because our dollar payments have to go through uh, america and there they will be stuck we can't do business in euro except except through banks in third countries so that way our our uh, dealings with russia are restricted in terms of uh, trading with russia however we must also remember that our trade with russia is not such a major part of our foreign trade you know even in the best of times we've not had a trade turnover more than 10 billion dollars whereas our trade with the us is well over 150 and with uh, china around the same level and so you know uh, it's not a major restriction of our trade uh, possibilities but what we have tried to do is now because of the restrictions on oil uh, the us has banned oil imports from russia so you know russia's oil exports have been hit and therefore russia is now offering oil at cheaper prices we have happily picked up this uh, oil at cheaper prices which is good for us why should we punish our people by not by buying oil at a more expensive price when it is available at cheaper price so mm -hmm. we are doing that we are buying oil we are at the same time also let us remember that the west when they imposed the sanctions they were very clever you know even america when it said that i will not buy russian oil and russian gas they don't need to because they have enough of their own they did not ban russian uranium because uranium goes into their power plants nuclear power plants which then provide electricity to people they do not want the electricity bills of people to go up similarly you uh, europe cannot stop russian gas imports and russian oil imports so quickly so easily because 60% of its energy comes from russia so even there they have taken carve outs in areas that impact on their economy there are many other carve outs i don't want to uh, uh, go on and on about it but each country has tried to make sure that its own critical economic interests are do not suffer that much in these sanctions which makes it all the more uh, hypocritical to tell us that you should also abide by sanctions why should we we will do the we will take the best deal available for our people for our uh, economy so uh, and then also let us remember we are not the only country holding out against sanctions there are even turkey which is a nato member has said that it cannot afford to have sanctions on russia and therefore it is actually helping in uh, in uh, trade with russia most of the west asian countries are not party to sanctions and you know countries like the uae are actually active in uh, in in uh, sort of being the entrepo for financial uh transactions with russia so there are many other countries as well which are uh, not party to sanctions and which are trading with russia so that's very insightful to learn sir and with everything that is happening in and around war a small fear has evoked uh, indicating the drive in motivation of other countries to take similar steps in favor of territory acquisition on these lines do you believe war in ukraine uh, would propel motivation for china to start their rift to acquire arunachal pradesh from india no i have always found this argument a little odd you know countries don't are not looking at other countries to see what they are doing and then uh, try to do the same every such action 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 in ukraine or whatever action such extreme actions that you can talk about they are all based on a country's uh, 
hard headed assessment of its national interests of its national threats and how it can take forward its interests not that that fellow is doing it and therefore i can do it or that fellow can do it and get away with it so i can do it and get away with it it's not that's not true either i mean that is a specific context there is a specific context of these uh, as i said european security architecture there is something that uh, russia wants that's something that people know what russia wants and how to deal with it now and also for some reason russia selected this timing for whatever reason so all of these aspects cannot be duplicated everywhere else uh, so you can't say because russia invaded ukraine and got away with it china will invade uh, arunachal pradesh and say that it will get away with it or on the other hand that if china invaded ukraine and came to grief that uh, sorry that russia invaded ukraine and came to grief china will therefore say that i will not invade you are not will neither of these arguments is valid so each decision is taken on its own merits in in consideration of the uh, situation of the uh, geopolitical economic uh, uh, situation existing around that region and around that decision and if re really speaking you know china has many territorial uh, uh, sort of aspirations ambitions it's not just arunachal pradesh it's also taiwan it's also a number of islands in the uh, south china and east china sea so there are a number of areas where china could if it wanted to or if it felt that the, the time was right for it to uh, invade and take uh, action and none of that would be dependent on whether russia uh, succeeds in ukraine or fails in ukraine well that's really great to know sir uh, because this was one of the thing which uh, started appearing often in a lot of uh, spheres both on social media as well as some channels and that created a lot of question marks around but the answer which we got clarified the whole thing and uh, coming to our uh, uh, challenge coming to our external security how are we usually dealing with countries which we need to be watchful about in it can be in sphere of economy relations maritime air and land well i think the the best example is that of china that we are dealing with in so many different uh, on so many different planes now on the one plane you are there in ladakh where uh, our armies are face to face with the chinese army and we are continuing to talk to china about how we can disengage how we can uh, de escalate and how we can bring the situation back to the status quo so that while we have territorial disputes we know that we are our border is not being settled at least we maintain peace until such time as we find a way of sorting it out at the same time we our trade with china is booming as i mentioned even after the uh, uh, 2020 incident uh, in ladakh our trade has increased uh, and on on a, on a separate plane what we are trying to do is to reduce our dependence on china for critical material uh, whether it's rare earths whether it is uh, chips whether it is uh, 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 api the pharmaceutical uh, raw material uh, so we are trying to see how we can either diversify or create domestic capacity we are looking very carefully at chinese investments in india we don't want china to invest in india in areas which can enable it to get a a toe hold on critical sectors of our economy we are very careful about communications equipment because they can uh, create uh, problems in the future especially as we go up from to from 4g to 5g and and uh, when the fifth generation communications in, uh, networks Uh, uh, control a larger part of our economy so you have this very uh, nuanced and graded approach with a country where you have uh, uh, strong economic relations but care being uh, exercised in sectors in which you are dealing with that country and a face off military face off at the border so all of it comes in uh, to uh, when you are dealing with china also you are talking to other countries who are neighbors of china and who are also uh, apprehensive about the manner in which china is dealing with them there again uh, you are talking to them about how you can sort of uh, prevent china from expanding its hegemonistic approach so all of this comes into our uh, 
uh, dealing with China. So it's not just one. That's why I said right in the beginning that you don't classify countries as as uh, enemies, friends, and frenemies. Every country you have to deal with depending on the specificities of that country. You're on mute, I think. Sir, uh, coming to the internal security, what are some of the challenges in, in internal security we have at hand? And are these internal challenges coming out as an advantage for the external uh, countries to protect their interests against our nation and how it is handled as a package? Yeah, you know, security these days, very few security issues can be classified solely as internal security issues. Security issues are very complex, they are interlinked, they are very varied, um, and they, many of them have external linkages. But if you were to look at it, what are our, what, and again, uh, the, the uh, security, many people think of security in terms of traditional uh, areas like, uh, you know, you talk about extremism, you talk about uh, uh, cross-border terrorism, you talk about cyber terrorism, cyber threat. But there are so many others what used to be called non-traditional security threats, which are also security threats like water shortages, which create uh, the lack of water security can uh, is a major, I mean, it, it has various ramifications. It's been spillover into violence and terrorism as well. Energy security. And then I, I talked about materials, you know, where we had the excessive dependence on other country for materials that are critical for our economy. Material security. Resources, uh, resources security, which is uh, similar to material security. So, you know, anything that threatens the growth of economic, uh, growth of the economy, threatens equitable development, is in a way a security threat to the country. They can create, in fact, security th uh, security threats that you recognize like violence and uh, uh, interregional problems and in fact intra-regional problems and sub-national issues and so on. So security has to be looked at at a holistic, in a holistic manner. Uh, so you have, of course, you have extremism of various kinds. And then I talk about extremism uh, in terms of internal security. I mean, not only, you know, left-wing radicalism or communal issues, uh, communal extremism, but also cultural extremism, uh, regional, sub-regional extremism, where where cultures are fighting against cultures within, in fact, even a region. All of these are internal security threats. Many of them have economic uh, roots, and therefore being able to deal with the economic sources of those uh, threats and and in many cases also they are there is there are external linkages there is funding from abroad there is encouragement from abroad there is some political objective behind these which which uh, so you need to deal with these in a holistic manner now in more traditionally of course you can talk about uh, military threats uh, which are threats to your internal security again i talked about defense uh, uh, dependence on other countries for defense equipment that that is a major threat, the national security threat, because if tomorrow you are attacked by a country, you need to make sure that your relations with other countries are such that the flow of arms, which is required to meet this threat, uh, uh, continues. Also, you have surveillance technologies and various kinds of border uh, management technologies where we are dependent on outside. So that's again, an, in, it's an internal security threat with external linkages. Similarly, today, you know, space, has become a major uh, field uh, domain uh, posing both a security threat and its surveillance can improve your security uh, uh, within the country. Again, this is something that it, it, it has both domestic, domestic capacity building is required as well as external uh, cooperation is required. Information and electronic warfare, again, these are both uh, uh, domestic as well as external linkages. Then you look at Technology of various kinds. You know, one of the things that uh, the, the, the uh, COVID taught us is that 
our structure, not more, not only our medical facility for treating, medical infrastructure for treating and for reaching various regions for treating such ailment, but also of early warnings of being able to uh, immediately uh, ramp up research in order to improve the way in which such viruses and the incoming future viruses can be uh, tackled. So biosecurity, the, the research in virology, in such a manner, a research in virology that is internal and external also to see how these viruses are developing around us and how they could impact on us. So this is another area, which is a very niche area, but very important which COVID taught us. Cyber, of course, is very important, as you know now, with the, the kind of cyber threats that every sector of our economy is facing. Uh, and and as, as we become more digital, the impact of cyber threats become greater. The need to develop, the need to train cyber professionals in various niche areas, the ability to, to protect yourself against cyber threats, both internally and externally, becomes a very important uh, security area. And then, uh, of course, you talk about geopolitics, you talk about the threat. Now, if uh, just as we saw in the Russia-Ukraine thing, if, if, we, if our... Uh, uh, actions had uh, led to, say, America imposing sanctions on our Russian imports of defense equipment from India, uh, from Russia, defense equipment from Russia. That would have been a major uh, security threat. So these are geopolitical developments which which could which have the potential for causing security threats to India. Similarly, any, any political actions that are taken to prevent you from and doing something that you believe in your national interest, whether it's political or economic. So you have, again, so as I said, you know, you have a range of security threats. The linkages, the intertwining of the internal and the external is these days very great. Both globalization and technology, the spread of technology has ensured that. So we have to look at security in a kind of holistic manner, and we have to understand that what we used to think 20 years ago was security, is not the only security. That today, everything can be a security threat. Economic, water, materials, resources, information, space, electronic. All of these have potentially security implications of various kinds. So, sir, um, in general way, this was one of our uh, uh, very curious question, which kind of put a question mark in our minds for quite a long time. So, when the nation faces a terrorist attack or an external attack, uh, recently, we have seen uh, how uh, um, India responded to Pulwama, and we have also witnessed how India responded to 26-11. So, is it a good option to retaliate uh, like we did in Pulwama, or to end with a peace note for no further escalations like it happened uh, for 26-11? And what are the advantages of one over the other? I would say there is no set formula for dealing with such security threats. Uh, it depends on the time, the place, our capacity, and the nature of the aggressor. Uh, you ultimately, the best way to deal with terrorism is deterrence. And this deterrence comes in a variety of forms. One is the cost to that country or actor of carrying out a terrorist act against you has to be so high that he will not consider doing it. Now, this way of increasing this cost, there are various ways of doing it. Uh, one is, of course, the Pulwama kind that you you hit back it so strongly that he knows that you will hit back uh, if there is a terrorist act. Two can be if you are in a position to create economic damage to him if he creates uh, trouble for you. Three, very important, is that you have to build up your own national defenses. And that, you know, if you make it as well, over a period of time, if you make it more and more difficult and more and more expensive for a terrorist to cross your border, because you have surveillance equipment and the way of getting over all that will be very expensive for him. Because you are able to pick him off when he comes into the country and shoot him when he's here. So your defense mechanism, your the technologies that you use, the intelligence 
systems that you've put in place and the strength of the domestic local networks that you create in order to find and root out a terrorist attack even before it takes place. All of this put together your own domestic internal capacity, technical intelligence, domestic, the, uh, people. So all of these put together are how you deal with uh, terrorist attacks. Now, uh, one of the things that our national security advisor, uh, Mr. Dole, is very fond of saying is that, look, what you notice is the attack that gets through. What you do not notice are the attacks that were actually deterred and were uh, prevented. Now, you know, if I if there are 100 attempts to attack me and I somehow forestall 99 of them, you will catch me for the 100th one that succeeded. Not praise me for the 99 that I have prevented. So essentially, I would say that our defense mechanisms against such terrorist attack by a combination of the measures has improved considerably over time and has therefore the number of attacks has reduced considerably over time. But as I said, the most dramatic things are the ones that succeed and the ones that take notice. The moment something happens, they say, ah, oh, who's there? Who's looking after this? The great failure of uh, security and so on. So anyway, the, the intention, the objective of any security agency has to be to reduce the incidence of these terrorist attacks. So, you know, your success rate from, if today it is 0.9, you gradually increase it to 0 0.91, 0 0.92, 0 0.93, 0 0.94. Now, it will be tending towards one, but it can never reach one. But the closer to one it reaches, the more successful you are, the more difficult you're making to the uh, making it for the enemy to breach your defenses. And that is, I think, the uh, objective. Well, that these are like really valuable insights, sir. With that, we reach uh, end of our session with uh, Raghavan, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for being us here with us here today and educating us about topics that most of us have moderate idea, but in immense curiosity to learn about. And I'm very sure that I'm speaking on behalf of audience when I say that it was such an illuminating and great experience interacting with a man of uh, US stature and uh, cadence. Once again, on behalf of Team Grasp, Thank you for being with us here today. And to all the audience, we request you to subscribe to our channel for more such uh, engagements and more such lectures on several interesting topics. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot, sir.